right okay um so i today give you last lecture and that's good for me and um so i don't know if my message came across because sometimes i'm confused but um one of the thing is that um you know i'm not concentrating on supersymmetry here but um so let me summarize what i did last time and then i will switch to 5d otherwise i would not have um, so we were discussing last time Chen Simon theory. Chen Simon theory. Simon's theory. And um, I even didn't bother to write for you all super all fields, all transformation, etc. And if you look uh, up, so for example, it's written if you want to look it up. So I think uh, it's paper from 2012 by my former student, Shalen. Um, so it's called cohomological blah blah Chen Simon theory. So what is important that if you write everything, all transformation, etc., I mean, they look complicated, but in fact, they're not that complicated. So let me just try to write to you. Uh, so this is connection. Then I have my um, field chi. So connection is a, at linearized level, it's a one form. These guys are horizontal two forms. Then I have a ghosts. This is uh, zero forms odd. Then I have this field sigma, well, sort of. Then there is psi, then there is h. Uh, And there is C bar, again, this is zero form odd, and there is a B. It's a Lagrangian multiplier. So if I use notations, again, it's very symbolically. Uh, so in this direction, that's what I call A operator, and in this direction, this is D operator. So any complicated things are actually done like this. So uh, this guy, so this part, again, it's not realized, it's not a common knowledge, but this part is actually a transverse elliptic problem. Problem. And this, guys, is correspondently where you localize. It's LV plus whatever adjoint of your sigma. So it, you know, it's hard to realize. You have to play with these things, <coughs> etc. And for example, when you write supersymmetry, of course, uh, you know, original. If you write supersymmetric theory, it's even more obscure. But uh, in a way, the structure which I told you right away, it's always, you know, done like this. So we always. Um, so I will now for you write five D, but we always will have these spaces. So we always have two type of complexes. E0, E1, E2, for example, that can be go to zeros. Then there will be some spaces F1, F2, uh, sorry, F0, F1, F2. I mean, they can go, for some theories, they go longer, the high dimensions you go. And then there are these errors. So again, uh, this is typically different Ds, this is R. And at linearized level, I always have S determinant of R and whatever cohomology on the kernel of my operator D. That's always the answer how it's organized. So for example, here's the natural problem. So this basically was uh, suggested, all the things was written in 97 by, in the paper by Losef, Nikrasov, um, and Bollet. And that's a lift of two-dimensional problem, and two-dimensional problem is elliptic problem. So here is actually, I mean, this is a DRAM. This is DRAM projected to horizontal guys, etc. So this is exactly transversal elliptic problem, and it comes from the lift of two-dimensional problem. Any any things, anything coming from supersymmetry always has a structure. That was one of my message. I don't know if I got in, uh, you know, across. Of course, it's maybe a bit complicated, etc. Um, so again, a few words about Chen Simon that you understand um, what we are trying to do. So we are trying to build all fields. So we are trying to 
space of connection, then we put some bundle over this and, you know, we put more fields. Important thing that we want to localize over LV plus adjoint of sigma, which is constant gauge transformations. Constant gauge transformations. If you do everything properly, it's a subtle. It has been done in paper by Peston uh, because you also have to treat zero modes. I mean, there are some subtleties. Uh, so the fixed points here is very simple. So the fixed points here is just, so if I'm looking at S3, so my student did it on general ciphered, and then story becomes more complicated. Uh, but on S3 is just F equals zero sigma equal to constant. Okay. And then eventually what I told you, so the integral the, on S3, what becomes just integral with D sigma. Um, so you, well, you basically integrate over uh, Lie algebra. So let, let me write answer in two ways, minus some number, trace of sigma square, and then he will, basically if you cancel everything, this is as determinant of a horizontal zero. Uh, that forms LV of plus adjoint sigma. And that's why you use index theorem here. So try to do it yourself if you don't get it. So you basically do a mode expansion over your hop vibration and index theorem tells you about cancellations. <coughs> okay. And um, there are some subtleties which I'm not telling you. They're written in this paper. I'm taking square roots here, and I don't care about details, but it's very subtle. It will have effect on this coefficient. As you know, in Chen Simons, uh, level gets shifted uh, by uh, basically dual cosetter number. So if you do take square roots correctly, everything uh, works correctly. And eventually the answer, if you want to look it up, it's integral over Cartan, over D sigma, integral minus, again, some number trace of sigma square. And then, also, by the way, here's this determinants also, don't forget that I always have uh, here uh, whatever my manifold is, three and Lie algebra valid. So determinant also assume that I have a Lie algebra valid, guys. And here's integral of a whole algebra. Here you reduce over Cartan, and then this is over all roots not equal to zero sine of I beta sigma. And that coincides with what Witten found many years ago. It's integral representation which Marino found to study large chain. So it's very convenient to study large chain. Okay. So that was just repetition of uh, 3D story. So my main message was for you to say that, again, I basically wanted to stress this point of view, which is, of course, a bit formal, uh, but this is actually ability for us to calculate it. Now, again, supersymmetry can be mapped. You heard a lot of lectures about supersymmetry. There is a map to map supersymmetry there. And uh, OK. Any questions about this stuff? So now we'll switch to 5D. So in 5D, everything will work the same way. The things just will get more complicated. The paper you referred to was this, or you also mentioned one by Peston? Do you have the reference? Oh. Peston, it's uh, origin of everything, OK? That's, that's like a Bible. But that's, uh, I mean, commentary to the Bible, OK? Uh, so this is exactly paper where uh, my student, former student, dealt with cohomological Chen Simon theory, I mean, this concrete theory on ciphered manifolds. Okay. Right. Um, any other questions about this 3D before we go to 5D? Uh, so, again, all theories basically, just to give you an idea, then you have all this 2D, 3D, uh, 4D, 5D, well, I mean, there is 6D, 7D. There are good reasons to stop at 7D. 
And um, so typically, uh, quite often, if you look up, so for example, if you look at, uh, I mean, theory which you localize here, it's n equal to, and they're related about these conditions, which is good elliptic problem. Then actually, here is the same theory n equal to, it's, you m map it here, so it's basically around uh, the lift of this problem, so which becomes transversely elliptic problem here. Okay, so uh, then the standard problem about which Nikita was talking here, so this is again n equal to, so n equal to here and n equal to here mean different things, it's a different theories of course, because if you leave this theory up here, it's n equal 1, which you don't know how to localize. So n equal to here originally is related about this problem, that's what Nikita was talking about. <laughs> If you lift it up here, then that's what I will discuss now, this problem. So the role of Peston here, uh, what he did, it's actually a reduction of this problem from 5D. And this is transverse elliptic problem. So I don't want to talk about this that much. They're supposed to come. Hopefully, this is year our paper with uh, Fistucci, uh, John Q, and Jacob Winding. So, I don't know, hopefully, we'll come this year where we explain all the things. Uh, but his problems, whatever operators he gets, it's transverse elliptic, it's just tilted reduction of this problem. So, uh, and then you can keep going. There is elliptic problem here, there is its lift here, etc. So, my now interest will be here. Um, so supersymmetry always basically picks you either elliptic problem or transversely elliptic depending on context. Okay, right. Um, so the idea what, so just let me give you some words uh, and that's the original idea goes back to 97 basically, 97 by this Losev, Nikrasov, Berlin. And uh, what they did is that if you have a four manifold, you have naturally this F plus problem. And if you try to put, it's very natural, there is a way to lift uh, this problem to five dimensional manifold. And what you have to do, so you have to introduce a vector field dt, I mean, so t is along this direction, and then what would be natural to do dt f equal to zero and f horizontal plus equal to zero. Well, horizontal means that I have legs only here. Again, this problem, in fact, is not, I mean, don't analyze it. It would have transverse elliptic, it's too many solutions. So actually the, well, I will tell you. So the idea is now in 5D what I have to do, I mean, this is of course, that's what this guy suggested was a uh, local picture, what we have to covariantize it. So I have to discuss for you a bit of geometry. So this would be now crash course on a contact geometry. Uh, so let me discuss two minus n manifolds. So in fact, 3D falls down to the same class as just, I mean, 3D is more boring, 5D, there are infinitely many examples. Uh, so I have two n minus manifold and you call it contact manifold, contact manifold, if there is exists a contact form such that kappa d kappa n is nowhere to zero. So contact manifolds is generalization of symplectic manifolds. Uh, so the simple thing is that if you take, I mean, typically usual system in Rn, you pick up some Hamiltonian reasonable and you look at constant energy levels, this is becomes a contact manifold. The idea is such a way that there is exists a plane where d cup is an actually invertible. So it's like a symplectic form. Okay. So what is important to hold this story that uh, there is exist, there is exist and it's unique, what's called rib vector field, field V. 
which satisfies the following conditions IV cup equal to 1, IV D cup equal to 0. So if you fix kappa with this condition, so if kappa does not satisfy this condition, then it's not guaranteed, otherwise it's unique. So for example, you know, that's what I kept telling you on hop vibration, for example, you can choose the things always, that they satisfy all these conditions, okay? Um, right, then um, the robot we will need is the following, that the picture if you wanna look visually, or dimensional manifolds. Um, so by the way, so just tell you that any three-dimensional manifold is contact manifold, for example. There is no abstraction for orientable manifold to be contact. In 5D, uh, well, there are some non-contact manifold, but most of them are contact. So the picture is the following, uh, that you actually have some plane, you have direction R, and this is what's called contact plane, contact plane. And here you have D kappa, and this is basically non-degenerate. It plays the role of symplectic form. So there is again exist actually a, a metric, uh, always exists, such that, uh, such that uh, what, um, G, uh, R, G, V is equal to kappa. So basically what I'm telling you, I always can choose the metric that this plane is orthogonal. So by this plane, you understand distribution uh, and you can make them basically orthogonal and you can make this choice. And moreover, on this plane, you can choose almost complex structures that there is exist almost complex structure. It's a point like thing. So any, basically any, uh, or dimensional manifold upon choice of contact structure, you choose one direction, you have a plane, and this plane, I mean, locally looks like a standard symplectic manifold. Again, there are no abstractions for these structures to exist. Okay, so what's a catch in 3D, in 5D, etc.? So the catch is the following, that uh, if I'm on such manifold, so if I choose a structure, so I choose V, contact form and a metric compatible, then it means that for any manifold, I can uh, do the following decomposition of P form. I can decompose this P vertical form plus P horizontal form. So this is a form which is given by this projector. And this is given by this projector. So please prove, so exercise. So prove that these two spaces are orthogonal. Two spaces, spaces are orthogonal. So to prove it actually think what GV it means. So basically what the hint is that you have to use conditions that IV star is up to sign will be star kappa, wedge, whatever your form. That's type of conditions. And that basically follows from this thing. So that's the way. So this is orthogonal space. So now we go to uh, five dimensions, so 5D. So in 5D, if I look, so I'm in particular interested in looking at two forms on five manifold. Okay. And on uh, five forms, I can decompose them as a vertical two forms, okay? Plus, of course, horizontal two forms. And on horizontal two forms, there is exist what you would expect because effectively, for, I mean, this is linear algebra and we are not discussing any, any integrability. So these guys, uh, I mean, local, I mean, as a space, it looks exactly as a two forms in four dimensions. So you should not be surprised that there is exist further decomposition. So actually, there is exist the following further decomposition in horizontal self dual plus horizontal anti self dual. So the operator which does for you this is one over two uh, 
plus IV star. And an operator here is 1 over 2, 1 minus IV star. Um, so you see what is going on. So uh, you take a star on two form, you get a three form, you contract with V. So this is would be necessary in horizontal space, etc. cetera. Uh, again, please prove that this is projectors. The only warning is this is projectors not here, not on whole space. This is projectors on horizontal forms, okay? So they actually this operator squares to itself. So to prove that it's projector, have to take this guy, take it square, and it squares to itself. Then it's a projector. So it's important thing that if you try to do this calculation on the whole space, you will fail. So it's actually projectors on this subspace. So then you have this decomposition, and again, you can prove that this is orthogonal spaces. And this is true for any contact manifold, actually this compatible metric, and metric always exists. So here, if I start to think, so if I have the structure, there is very natural lift of instant on. So basically what I would try, it's natural to do the following. So I will take a horizontal guy and put to zero, right? And then I will have a, a vertical guy put to zero. So again, I'm warning you, this is not transversely. I mean, it has nothing to do to ellipticity. There are too many conditions. Because this is three, this is four, this is seven conditions. Uh, this problem can be embedded in elliptic problem. Uh, this waffa witten type of problem. That's what Nikita was talking yesterday about in 4D, in 5D. It exists similar story. Okay. So this, in fact, uh, Thing you can re write in to totally equivalent way. Uh, you can write that star of f equal to minus kappa wedge f. Prove it. Again, it's a simple algebra. So these things imply this and vice versa. Um, so we call this contact instanton. Contact instanton. So just one comment um, that supersymmetry actually uh, prefers one particular sign here. Uh, I mean, formally you can write when you look here, you can also equally write anti-cell dual, etc. So of course, if you change here minus to plus or plus to minus, then you get here different sign. Uh, one sign is good and others is not good. Uh, one sign actually relates to supersymmetry and also it's important thing that uh, with this choice of sign actually the young mills equation is automatically satisfied. With another choice of sign it's not satisfied. So supersymmetry actually pin, I mean, takes you one contact instant on. So there is no reason to differentiate them. Okay. So I'm writing what supersymmetry actually is picking up. So this is later on what we will try to localize. And I mean, this is a rather complicated equation and we have very limited idea how it's solved. And again, it's, um, yep. So let me just, before I will, uh, which the construction of the theory. I need a bit more to tell you about contact geometry and give some examples, and we will concentrate, of course, on S5. Uh, so all this contact stuff is very much related to supersymmetry because there are the following thing. So when I have a contact manifold, then there is exists a very canonical <coughs> way uh, you just can put a plus line here, and this would call simplectiz simplectization, which is the following thing that I can introduce for you omega, which would be dr square kappa. 
So R is just coordinate here. So this would be symplectic form. In principle, you can think this is a cone. So this is uh, like a conic manifold. So this is a cone. So your manifold is like this. This is your m to n minus 1. Okay. So this is symplectic. So then, of course, what has been very natural, it's introduced a metric on the cone, which would be exactly dr plus r square metric on my odd dimensional manifold. So then, uh, you know, so this is manifold as a cone, it becomes even dimensional. And in even dimensions, we know a lot of nice, uh, you know, geometry. So first thing is that uh, if <coughs> your cone is Keller manifold, then uh, these guys call this Sasaki, Sasaki manifold. So this is a definition. I mean, you can write this intrinsically in terms of odd dimensional manifold, but you can just basically construct the cone and require this. Now, if cone is Calabi Yao, then two n minus one is called Sasaki Einstein Sasaki Einstein manifold. manifold. There is a very fundamental theorem. That's where supersymmetry pops up. And that's why 5D becomes incredibly rich. And 4D, we don't know much. Uh, because uh, there are very fundamental theorems which are saying that if you, wanna f if you have a metric cone and you want to find killing spinners on the base of the cone, it's equivalent to finding currently constant spinners on the whole cone. Now, Calabi, yeah, it's exactly where we know there are co uh, currently constant spinners. So it means that Sasaki Einstein manifold admits killing spinners. So there is automatically supersymmetric young mills. So in 5D, I mean, we automatically get millions of examples. Not just millions, but we get simply uh, a lot of examples of historic geometry, etc. In 5D, nothing. Actually, oh, sorry, in 4D nothing, and the reason is very simple, because if you try to apply this construction, I mean, there is, we actually, I mean, we don't have any good class of manifolds in uh, 5D with currently constant spinners, but in 6D it's Calabi Yaws with all this geometry. And uh, so to give you a concrete example, So again, my interest in this, so S5, right? So S5, this is this condition in, in C3. So the cone of S5, right, it's just a spherical coordinate. This is C3 by itself. So C3 is obviously Calabi Yau. Yeah. So all killing spinners related to covariantly spinners on uh, C3. And so there are plenty of killing spinners. Um, I will talk to you about this geometry in a moment, but let me just give you a hint why whole science, I mean, in this particular respect becomes uh, very nice because I can produce for you millions of examples of manifolds. If I have time, I can tell you how, what's going on there. Of course, I will concentrate for the sphere mainly. Uh, but that's why 5D story is interesting because, uh, I mean, we do know how to produce story Calabi-Yaus cones. It's very, very simple, right? So what you have to do, I mean, thanks to topological string theory, people studied a lot of calabi -Yaus. And exactly, exactly the same things. The only thing we have to require that they are cone 
and we have to just look at the base of the cone, etc. Uh, so, for example, uh, I mean, famous example, conifold. Right? You take a C4 and you do simple equation 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Then you get conifold. If you look at the base conifold, so the base, this is called T11. It's a Saki Einstein manifold, so you can write supersymmetric theory there. So topologically, it's S2 times S3. So, I mean, it's automatically, it's, there are killing spinners, killing spinners uh, related, all this related to contact geometry, the supersymmetric young mills, etc. So then, of course, it, I mean, you can keep going. So, for example, another example would be uh, the following. If you take P minus Q, P plus Q, minus P minus P, and the divisor, So this is called uh, the base. So uh, this gives me, so if I do this quotient, symplectic quotient, so P and Q are just two integers positive, let's say they are co-prime. Uh, then if I do this quotient, I get kalabi yau cone. If you look at the base, this is this famous YPQ spaces. Again, topologically, S2 times S3. So in, in this example, the, the horizontal four manifold uh, it exists sort of only as a transverse structure. So it, it's not really as a manifold. So it, but still, is it okay to say that solve the anti self equation on the on that thing? It's not a manifold. It's it's a good thing. No, first of all, you don't care about if it's manifold or not. So what you are talking about, it's a regular. So for example, this is a regular thing. Uh, this is not regular. Um, so let me give you, that's a good point that you raised. Absolutely. But the equation by itself makes sense. What we would suspect that most of the time there will be no smooth solutions. So they will be singular. But in a way, if you look at Nikrasa's story, it's exactly, I mean, the only interesting solutions if you put omega background to everything only single. Of course, it's a purely speculative fact. I don't know how to uh, look at this. So let me, uh, that's a good question you ask. Uh, so let me give you example at the level of the sphere. So I have sphere and then uh, what is important that I have a T, T3 acting on S5. And this is basically done that zeta i goes to E alpha i zeta i. Okay. So if I rotate by phase every three zetas, of course, this condition is preserved. So then, uh, of course, there is one case for which I can uh, choose. So this is when V is equal. So let me say that for every guy, I would have a diagonal rotation. So I will have a vector field E1, E2, E3. So this is a vector field corresponding correspondently, if I write my T3, it's just S1, S1. As well. Okay. Um, so of course, if I take diagonal guys, so first choice, if I take my v to be just e1 plus e2 plus e3, so it means that all zetas are rotated by the same face, identical face. This corresponds to hop vibration. And this is what's called regular uh, contact structure. So you can actually write kappa very explicitly. So let me give this exercise. Write kappa explicitly. This is basically a problem about writing connection on Hopf bundle. So S5 is S1 bundle over CP2. So by the way, many exercises I told you, you can upgrade them instead of doing S3 uh, over CP1. Now you can do S5 over CP2. There are more coordinates, etc. about Fourier modes, everything. It just, it requires more guts and CP2, I mean, requires not two patches, but three patches actually, okay? So now um, this, if you look at orbits of these guys, they're regular. 
So this is just regular S1 sitting over CP2, okay? So let's confront with other cases. Uh, so actually, So what I can do, another choice, is the following. Uh, let me choose omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, some numbers, real. Well, in fact, it's better to choose them positive if I want to say that it comes from. So then uh, E1 plus E2, omega 2, uh, me, omega 2, E2 plus omega 3, E3. And let me choose them generic. So generic, well, that's, you know, uh, so Nikita spent yesterday a lot of time to discuss in epsilon when they're not generic. So they're typically rational. So I'm actually requiring for these guys to be irrational. I want to avoid rational points. Um, so then, in fact, you also can construct kappa. There is a contact structure. So this is all examples of what's called toric contact uh, geometry. So whenever your rib vector field is related as a combination of torus things, then this is uh, toric contact geometry. And uh, in all these examples, it's an example of toric contact geometry. So now you can ask uh, the question how the structure looks like. So, uh, in principle, uh, how can you visualize a sphere if you want to uh, think about T2 vibrations? Well, very easily, right? So, you have this equation. Right. So, uh, what I would like, so my torus is just basically a face of every, this guy. If I look at this equation, it's basically a triangle. And then over this triangle, I have a generic vibration of T3 on the edges it degenerates on T2 and on the vertices it degenerates to T1. So this edge, for example, would be zeta1 equal to zero. This is zeta2 equal to zero. This is zeta3 equal to zero. So basically, it's a, you can think of S5 as a T3 vibration over triangle when you go to different things, there is different de degenerations. So analogous story just for S3. So here's the story the following. It's much easier to visualize. It's just a uh, vibration of, uh, of interval. And then when you come here, it degenerates one thing, it comes here, it degenerates another cycle. So here's a very similar story. It's a bit, uh, you know, I cannot draw for you T3, over etc. but you sort of understand, so it's degenerate. And the important thing that it generates now here is one. So then uh, you can ask which vector field this has a close rib orbits. And for rational omegas, the only rib orbits, so the close orbits, it sits here. So in fact, the conjecture, of course, you know, we are not mathematicians, but this is a conjecture that if you would try to solve this equation here, then there are no smooth solutions and there will be only singular solutions sitting in this closed rib orbits. But this is purely conjecture. But generically, most of the situations, the interesting contact structure, they're in fact not regular. So there is no actually any manifold, etc. So the situation with S5, I mean S5 written S1 over CP2, this is very non-generic. I have to choose actually coefficients 1, 1, 1. But I can choose them irrational numbers. And in fact, it would be very important when I will try to write the general result and relate to Nikrasov's story. Okay, so this is about geometry. Any questions? Because by absence of the questions, I understand that you completely decoupled. So everything is crystal clear, right?
So the uh, conjecture is that it has no smooth solution for a generic choice. Right. But uh, have you any insight if it's well less generic than one one one? Uh, like if it's rational, for example. Well, if it's rational, then basically you have a torus. So it's the same thing, uh, you know, Nikrasa was writing yesterday that it will close on the torus. You will have more orbits. Mm -hmm. By the way, there is whole Weinstein conjecture. So anybody who wants to get a million dollars or whatever. So this is one of the outstanding problems uh, in contact geometry to prove that any contact manifold has at, one, uh, at least one closed orbit. Uh, it has been proven only in three dimensions, and the thing is that you you actually use gauge theory. It's related to cyber grid and equations. In 5D, it remains to be open problem. So actually, every manifold, whatever contact structure you write, there will be at least one closed orbit. So for these things, you will have, for example, I mean, for this toric type, you will have three closed orbits on S5. So that's about geometry. Now, uh, what I actually would like to introduce uh, a theory, supersymmetric theory. So uh, I will write for you this theory in cohomological terms. But there is this theory for Sasaki-Einstein manifolds. It exists a supersymmetric theory, and there is a well-defined map one-to-one -one with the uh, things I'm writing. And again, I'm concerned only what physicists call vector multiplet, and I'm not discussing any matter multiplet, but everything can be added. And my main example, of course, will be S5. I may comment maybe later on about other things. So I have the story looks very much similar as before. So let me just write for you this theory. Delta A goes to Psi. Delta Psi goes to IVF plus ID sigma. So Delta Sigma goes to minus I, I V Psi. Delta um, chi h plus goes to h h plus. Delta h h plus goes to l v a chi h plus minus I think i sigma chi h plus. So let me uh, let me see that I'm not making it. Yep. So what's are the field? So A is a connection, of course. Then Psi is an odd one form in a joint. Sigma is a uh, uh, even bosonic uh, zero form in a joint. So then Kappa H plus is element of horizontal cell dual forms, uh, and this is odd. Odd, and again, it's an adjoint. So all fields except connection are not joint. And then H plus is in horizontal two cell dual forms. It's even, and it's an adjoint. So now on Sasaki Einstein manifolds, on Sasaki Einstein manifolds, so there is exist map between n equal one vector multiplet uh, to this cohomological field theory with all this transformation field theory. So this map is invertible, very nice, etc. I mean, we wrote it explicitly. Uh, typically, you know, to do these maps and everything to derive, the answer looks nice, but you have to do some nasty things, firtzing all these gamma matrices. So it's not something I particularly like, but, you know, some people do like. Okay, uh, so in a way, this is just to write in a vector multiplet. And here also what is important, if you actually start to count, for example, degrees of freedom. So <coughs> odd guys here are two objects. So this is where supersymmetry is extremely smart because I will tell you I will get very good problems, etc. But you see, I cannot by hand add some fields because this is guy is odd, this is odd, right? So psi. So this has five components because this is a five form and one form in five dimensions. 
this guy is a horizontal self-dual guy, right? So this has three component. So five plus three, this is exactly eight. This is how many Dirac spinners should have in four dimensions. So in a way, you know, the action which you will write have a Dirac operator, et cetera, and supersymmetry, so everything will work nicely. So when you, again, I'm repeating this statement I told you before, I cannot keep writing some other fields out of blue. My problems will be very badly defined. So all things are matched. Okay. Right. So this is just vector multiplet, etc. Of course, in reality, what you will do if you want to do a calculation, uh, you have to add more fields. So the missing fields, missing fields. Is C C bar B. So ghost, anti ghost, <coughs> ghost, and Lagrangian multiplier. So this is related to gauge fixing. So the story here again. Uh, it's not obvious, again, it requires some work, but I have to write actually all supersymmetry because I didn't write few ghosts. For example, if I start to write ghosts, they will be like, you know, plus, uh, you know, DA sigma, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the complex becomes bigger. So I, I wrote for your supersymmetry part. So one of important things of localization that I have to actually gauge fixed, write everything. And I have a non-trivial mixture of supersymmetry with BRST. So my BRST guys also have a super partners. So this is very important. So if I write everything sort of as a scheme, I told you before, so I will have C. So this is zero form odd. So then I would have here connection. So this is one form even. Then I will have chi field, which is two plus form horizontal. Okay. Uh, well, typically here we'll have another field which is C bar, which is just zero form odd. Then here we'll have, I'm a bit lying, it's not quite sick, but some combination of other fields, but let's not care about this psi. Then you have H, and then you have here B. So this would be DRAM, this would be D horizontal plus, plus another operator, which projects me here. Uh, I don't want to actually write it IV, D dagger. So this is plus, this is a dagger. And here, then the arrows go slide here. So all supersymmetries can be written like this. And now what I told you, so the problem I was telling you, so 4D truncation of this problem, that was elliptic complex. Now it becomes a transversely elliptic complex. So if you reduce this complex, not along the V direction, but all the other directions, you will get complex which Peston has in his paper, which is transversely elliptic. That's the nature of this complex. Okay. Uh, again, just believe me, I'm not writing for transformations. If I write everything, it's pretty messy. You can look it up in our papers. It's basically gen generalization of Peston paper. But it's important that that's a, a complex we have. And again, basically the idea that uh, this is your manifold, this is differentials, this is part of tangent bundle. So the story exactly the same. So you have this, you have this. So if I would write for you the answer, we'll discuss it now, but if I would write the answer around A equals zero. So the, my answer, by just looking at this, I can tell you exactly what it should be, because what it should be is the following. So I look at this object, I suppose to have a determinant 
because it's odd determinant comes upstairs, determinant of a zero form, one over two, LV plus adjoint of sigma. Then I'm going here, it's downstairs, it's a determinant of one over two, of one form, LV plus adjoint. Then I go here, then it goes, it's odd, it goes up, it's a determinant one over two, of horizontal cell dual forms of LV plus uh, adjoint of sigma. Then this is odd forms, it again goes up, it's zero form, so I just erase this guy. So, I mean, everything is built in. Of course, this is not the full answer, I'm basically looking at linearized things, but that's what is important. So if you Take this picture, write everything, but then you organize the things. So actually, I mean, this is coordinates on your supermanifold. This is, so this is analogs of x. So this is like x. This is like psi. Okay, so I will come back to this determinant in a moment. But let me now try to write for you burst exact terms. Any questions? Sir, probably it's a stupid question, but you read that we are acting by D on ghost and get approach to Yes. D, D is the RAM differential? Yes. And what does it mean that I'm acting by the RAM differential on ghost and get what is BRST transformation or gauge transformation? Do you remember from your childhood when you studied uh, BRST? No, I mean, tell, uh, if, I mean, then everybody should go back to BRST symmetry if you don't remember. I mean, I assume. So the thing is the following. So this is, I mean, this is something you should remember. This is very basic stuff. So this is a transform BRST transformation of connection. So you take a ghost and I mean, that's, you act by gauge transformation. So everything, how do you add ghosts here? You just look at gauge transformations and you write these things. So this acts in adjoint, so you add C Psi. So this acts in adjoint, you write C Sigma. This acts in adjoint, you write C H plus, et cetera, et cetera. So then, I mean, there is non-trivial thing is, I mean, you have to see how C transform, et cetera, you have to add. But the idea is that, uh, I mean, this is all related. This is very basic stuff. So when I was telling you that, uh, you know, this complex, for example, in 2D, uh, this is equivalent to the same problem as, um, when I was writing for f plus equal to zero, d dagger of a equal to zero. I mean, at the level of determinants, it's related to the fact that I have a ghost here. So, I mean, this is dualization of the thing. So, this is a problem when I look at elliptic complex, I equivalently can do Hodge theory and I can map it here. So, instead of writing this, I would write omega plus to omega two plus plus zero form. And then my operator here will be d plus plus d, I guess. Shit plus and dagger. So in, um, you know, in theory, all gauge symmetries, you forget about them. They're not there, you fix them. Ghosts take care of this. So ghosts sit here. So this is ghost, this is A, this is chi. Um, again, this is uh, once Witten wrote his Donaldson Witten theory. I think all these mathematical aspects were understood by Atia Jeffrey. So it's a very nice paper when they discuss all the things. But in a way, I mean, this, this is just, I mean, original BRST. So you do find F Popov trick, and that's if you write BRST without supersymmetry, this is what you will write. Any other questions? Stupid questions are okay.
with the devil. Okay, we write burst exact terms. Um, so what I will do again, I'm writing for you a simpler version. I mean, this is what is sort of convenient in the field. People do localization, you have to do with all fields, but a lot of things you sort of forget about, you know, ghosts, etc., etc. So I'm writing for a sort of gauge invariant part only. So I will write delta psi wedge star delta psi bar plus then I will have chi wedge star h so h plus plus h plus minus f horizontal plus okay so if you work out the thing then what you would get you will get the following so this would be f vertical star f vertical plus f horizontal star f horizontal sorry plus 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 da sigma star d sigma so this i actually related that we are working in euclidean theory so typically if you will get your 5d theory from reduction from 6d and you would like to keep all reality condition for spinners then you will reduce along time directions and your um, scholar will have a wrong kinetics, I mean, sign, and then you just have to do analytical continuation. That's why you have I there. So this is what you get. So first of all, um, one fact which you can work out that this is the same as terms F star F plus, uh, I don't have to write integrals, uh, plus kappa F wedge F. So, of course, my localization locus will be f vertical equal to zero, f horizontal plus equal to zero. So, this is exactly this contact instant on. And then um, there will be, of course, d of a sigma equal to zero. So, that's a localization locus. Now, what I wrote there is the following thing. So, of course, I mean, and that's where life becomes complicated. So, in uh, 3D, we just had a flat connection. And the flat connection on S3 is trivial. So, there is nothing to worry about this. Uh, now, the problem is that we have to solve this equation, and we have no idea about this equation, actually. But as first thing one can do, and that's, for example, related to many large checks of uh, whatever we did, is that there is the following solution of this equation. When uh, f equal to 0 and uh, sigma equal to constant. So f equal 0 on s, it's the same as a equal to 0 up to gauge transformations. Because it's simply connected guy. And moreover, this is, I mean, this is isolated point. There are no deformations of this uh, within this equation. So this is actually isolated point. So you may have more solutions, but it makes sense to isolated point. So this we call perturbative thing. And if you would assume that all other guys will be suppressed in large chain, that's basically the answer, at least which is relevant in large chain. So that's what I was writing for you. So let me go back to these determinants. So this actually, so this determinant, if I'm writing things more explicitly, this is integral over d sigma. I have this and then I have to evaluate my action. So I didn't write it. There will be some terms with sigma square, etc., which I didn't write it. So this would be some number sigma square term, well, basically times the volume of my manifold. Okay, so that's what I will get. And of course, here will be further corrections related to non-trivial non -trivial solutions of this equation. So let me first 
tell you about these determinants because you have to use exactly the same thing as before. Uh, so let's just go to simplest case uh, where in principle we have enough technology to do everything. So my V is just hop vibration, right? So actually what I can do here further on, I can do this decompositions. Two plus, this is the same as a horizontal uh, two zero plus horizontal zero two plus basically omega zero times omega. So omega is just a color form. Does it sound familiar? Let me check it. Huh? Did you hear already during this lectures about this? Good, yeah. So he already mentioned this a few times and, uh, during lectures. So I'm doing exactly the same thing. So I'm doing this in 5D, but you know, it's adjusted basically, it's a CP2 part direction. Right, so now I'm looking at this. So now one guys can be decomposed in the following way. So one forms are decomposed as a, uh, one zero horizontal plus horizontal zero one plus basically a zero form. This is just a vertical part. So I'm doing this just to look for you for these determinants, right? So I'm looking here and um, so now just look what is up there, what is down. So if I write everything up, so I will have upstairs there, I will have determinant, again, I'm not caring about phase, horizontal 2 comma 0, oh, I don't know, 0 comma 2 LV plus uh, adjoint. So because I had here two copies, I take a square root. Then I have a, a another of zero forms, and I have a zero form here. here. Yeah, and I'll show you faces. Hmm? And I'll show you faces. Uh, there are non-trivial faces, but un unlike, so we did calculate them originally, but it seems they do not appear in 5D. There are no any physics behind it. This is problem with physics. You're right when you have other checks to check that you're right, otherwise. So you do identical calculation like in 3D. In 3D you know it's correct, in 5D you have no clue. So presumably there is some reason that it's irrelevant. Okay. Uh, so then here determinant of zero form. So this is in power three over two. So one I had here and one comes from here. LV plus adjoint. So now look here. So I have one zero zero one. So let me, it's the same thing. Let me take square root. I'm in, uh, I'm ignoring the faces. So I will have uh, horizontal zero one LV plus adjoint, and then I would have a zero form. It's one over two zero form. So actually you can see that this guy cancel and you just have here one. So what you have here, you have basically as determinant of a horizontal forms zero bullet LV. So this complex uh, which has very natural operator, so I mean, all I mean, all zero zero forms horizontal. So there is this operator dh bar, horizontal zero one, horizontal zero two. So outside of this kernel of dh bar, actually everything will cancel. So I can actually go to cohomology of this operator, which is infinite dimensional. And then here I have to use uh, index theorem, so I can uh, tell you, I will not derive it, although I have written it somewhere. It's 
So the idea is the following, that in this setting on, um, so I can do it, so there are many ways of calculating things, but since we are talking about index theorems, we are talking, so here I can do exactly the same story. I can expand in modes and uh, all my modes, uh, so what I can do, I can do the following thing. It's exactly like in 3D, just to life becomes a bit more complicated. So if I have a horizontal form, 0p on S5, this is the same as the sum over n over 0p forms on CP2 with the values in O n bundle. So the calculation I told you, you know, you can think of this exercise, which is a bit more complicated. So you have to do all the CP2 stuff very, very explicitly. Which is, of course, uh, you know, more complicated, but otherwise. And the thing is, for example, you can derive that index of this Dalbo operator for n bundle twisted. It's just 1 plus 3 over 2 and plus 1 over 2 n square. So this is a difference. So the answer will look very much the same as before, but that's a factor you will have there. So you remember what I will actually will have. I will have a product of n's not equal to 0. And I will have whatever 2 pi i n plus a joint of sigma. And then here would have exactly this coefficient. So this is for round sphere, 1 over 2 n square. Uh, this is a special function. So actually, it's related. It's a special function. And um, it's related, it's a triple sign at special values, but if you take a log of this, it involves logs, dialogs, and three logs. So this is this type of special function. Um, but again, um, since I don't have time, I'm just suggesting for you play with this around. So the logic of playing and doing calculation is exactly, exactly the same as I told you before. So you have to prove this guy, you have to prove this formula. Again, you can do this formula either using some details of characteristic classes or doing equivalent things over CP2. Uh, so this is uh, for Dalbo twisted by O N bundle. You have to write everything explicitly. CP2 has a three fixed points. So you have to do this. Uh, the same uh, exercise I was very briefly telling you before. Okay, and that's what you get. Okay. Let me write you the modular answer. So, of course, be aware of uh, modular answer. And uh, there is actually a much more powerful trick uh, to do it, I can mention for you. So, if you would ask me to if I choose this V to be omega 1 plus omega 2 plus omega 3 generic. So this is just written when all omegas equal to each other and equal to 1. So this is what's called round sphere. Um, sorry, um, I meant here omega 1 E1 plus omega 2 E2 plus omega 3 E3. Three. Okay. Then the answer will look the following. So I can switch integral to Cartan. I will have minus classical piece, sigma square. Then I will have a product over roots, not equal to 0. And then I will have this function S3 of ix, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. So this function is called triple sign. Sorry, uh, I wrote not very precise. I, sigma with roots, pairing omega 1, omega 2, omega 3. So this is called triple sign. So 
So the functions are in fact very nice which appear there. So just to give you an idea, if you do on S1 things, you get a sign function. If you get things on S3, you get what's called double sign function. And if you do an S5, you get triple sign function. The question how it's defined. Sign is periodic. This function is defined in such a way that if you shift things by one of the omegas, so in a way it's double thing, right? So it has x and this would be omega 1, omega 2. So it has two periods. If you shift this by either omega 1 or omega 2, you will get sine. So double sine is periodic up to sine. Triple sine is periodic up to double sine, etc. So there are whole hierarchy of functions. So they're very nice functions. If you want to have explicit formula of S3 on um, x omega, this is the following. This is n1, n2, n3 from 0. Uh, and then you have x plus n on omega. And then you have another product n1, n2, n3. Now starting from 1 minus x plus n on omega. So that's explicit formula for triple sign. Again, uh, as a physicist, you understand this as a regularized thing. So this is entire function with the specified zeros. Uh, again, there are purely index theorems calculations calculate this for generic omega, but it requires a bit more work. That's why exactly you have to use full equivalent uh, index theorem for transverse elliptic operator. So this, I mean, this trick I told you works only with, um, I mean, um, for round sphere. Um, now, let me, um, so this is a function and for example, this is what really want for large n if you uh, basically believe that non-trivial solutions do con I mean suppressed in large n, then you can study asymptotics of these things and uh, large n and study and see that for example, it agrees whatever we would expect with things like AD, CFT, etc. Um, right. So the question is, um, okay, very good, but what's the general answer? I mean, how can we expect, etc.? The thing is the following, that things come from localization and actually, so my omegas for geometry, uh, when I choose geometrically, they're supposed to be real numbers. If I want actually to stick to contact structure to geometry. If I write this function, the function actually defined for any complex omega. And in a way, this is a story very much like a Nikrasov. I mean, it's the most natural thing. It's actually to assume your parameters to be, I mean, epsilon parameters, omega background to be complex. It's very natural. So in this story, it's also very natural to assume uh, parameters to be complex. So when they're actually complex, there is uh, the following factorization of this answer. So you can decompose this in the following things. So it will be 2 pi i x over omega 1, 2 pi i omega 2 over omega 1, 2 pi i omega 3 over omega 1, and cyclic permutation. So what this symbol means, I can tell you in a moment. So this symbol means the following thing. So for this factorization to work, there is some polynomial thing, E, some Bernoulli. This works actually, we need to make sure that these things are convergent. So let me write this explicitly. So if I would write for zeta, Q1, Q2, infinity, this is just Nm from zero to infinity, one minus zeta, Q1, N, Q2, M. And this is a good function if q1 is less than 1 and q2 is less than 1. If it's another region, there are other things to write. Uh, so you see for this convergence, for me, I have to guarantee that these guys actually models less than 1. It means that ratio of omega 2 of omega 1 should have imaginary parts. So if you... I mean, this is purely analytical result. So you can take the special function and decompose upon this analytical continuation. But what you can see if you stare at this guy, 
So this is actually a perturbative answer for Nekrasov partition function function on R4 times S1. And the beta, the radius of this is related to 1 omega 1. And then corresponding epsilon, it's omega 2 over omega 1 and omega 3 over omega 1. And then you have three pieces like this. So you have one piece, you have second piece, and three piece. You just do cyclic permutation on all these guys. So next thing it will be instead of omega 1, they will be omega 2, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so you have this decomposition result, and then also you can stare at purely um, at the local geometry because it's exactly So I told you about this picture of toric vibration of S5. And if I look at this corner, exactly, I told you that here in this corner, I have my uh, circle. So for general uh, values of omega. So what is important here that all these factorizations, I have to analytically continue in omega and my omega should be generic. Otherwise there will be extra problems, etc. But the thing is that you can also look at geometry and this is, of course, agrees because around on every point, this part looks locally like R4 of ball times S1. And if you identify parameters, so sphere is actually five sphere glued from three pieces like this. And, you know, toric geometry exactly gives you this parameter. So, I mean, you should not be surprised that uh, analytical continuation agrees with geometry. Then after thinking of this, that's okay, you calculated perturbative answer, it factorizes so nicely, etc. Then we know Nikrasov partition function for, uh, this is a 5D version, what uh, Nikita was de describing. So 5D version, if in 4D version on ADHM construction on modular space, you calculate the volume, you put one. If you put instead of one a roof genus, it's another characteristic class, it has uh, interpretation as uh, quantum mechanics of modular space. So it gives you 5D theory, but you know, it's a trigonometric version of what Nikita was discussing. So these objects are defined. So from this point of view, it's very natural to make the following conjecture, that the full partition function on S5 is equal to D sigma, whatever, some classical term, sigma square, and then there will be uh, and you cross of partition function of epsilon uh, for times S1 times another partition function times another partition function. And the parameters, of course, will be exactly what postulated omega 1, omega 3 of omega 1, 1 over gamma 1. Then, for example, here would be omega 2, omega 1, omega 3 of omega 2, 1 of omega 2. So this is analog. This is epsilon 1, epsilon 2, this is beta. And then here would be, so now remaining thing, it's omega 3, omega 1 of omega 3, omega 2 of omega 3, 1 of omega 3. And then of course you integrate here over sigma, so it depends on this sigma. So I didn't write explicitly perturbative part because you can put in there in the cross partition function. So it means, again, if you believe in this, you would basically say that your solutions, your own point-like instantons, is uh, sitting exactly around, so, you know, your instantons, I mean, instantons uh, in 5D, it's not, uh, I mean, instantons, it's uh, particles like, because in 5D, uh, they, I mean, the action is actually related to Hamiltonian 4D action, so they are particles there. So they sit around these things. So now, um, this is a story, it's very conjectural, uh, but let me uh, stress, this is a very important point about localization, 
And this is presumably, again, physicists don't care, but this is the most important problem uh, in localization compact spaces. So in two and in 2D and 3D, our localization locus is very small, and we understand this very well, etc. So, I mean, when I was telling you about Chen Simons, I didn't lie anything. When you go to Peston result, it's conjectured because his configuration actually is singular. He has no means to regularize them. He say they are there. Let's assume they are there. In Ikrasov story, uh, you don't have to worry because on non-compact space you have a lot of tools. He actually has well-defined modular spaces. He looks at fixed points. He regularizes, he calculates the current volumes. And for example, there is a story related to uh, non-commutative regularization. And all the stories agree. So in, in doing this story on R4, despite the fact that there are in singular configurations which don't worry, because actually singular configurations is just reinterpretation of these fixed points which is interpreted by this n tuples of Jan Tableau. Now, when we go in finite dimensional space, we have no modular space. We have nothing. So this is pure conjecture. So Peston conjecture thinks, and again, uh, everybody, I mean, in community, including Vasily, is aware of the thing. So, and the thing is that it's not uh, that easy mathematically to introduce any non-commutative regularization, etc. So, I mean, there is this problem. So this result is conjectured, and it's not even clear how to make it more precise, etc. And it's not clear if it actually makes sense to study the thing. So for example, I can prove there are no smooth solutions, and I can say that presumably if there are single, they sit around reborbits, but it doesn't mean anything. But of course, uh, you know, in the community, this type of answer is accepted. Uh, so we studied higher dimension, the problem just gets worse and worse. Of course, PDEs become uh, I mean, more and more complicated. Uh, in 3D and 2D, there are no problems. Even if you have vertices, you can get them not by localizing on the vertices, but you can localize on Coulomb branch and then do uh, contour integrals and then go to Higgs branch, etc. But here I wanted to tell you that this is presumably the biggest challenge. I mean, nobody questions the answer. But if actually Peston result can be made more precise in the long the line. So there is this friction between compact and non-compact uh, examples that you have to be aware. And in principle, it would be good to resolve it, but don't know. But again, there is many, many indirect checks and 4D, it's related to AGT, etc. So this is a correct answer. Yep. Uh, what's the classical action that you're localizing? Uh, classical action, I'm localizing, well, it's Young Mills, right? I, I didn't write there is a Chen Simons term I can write, etc. 5D. Oh, so the sigma squared. Yeah, yeah, sigma squared. Young Mills term. Uh, absolutely. So uh, this conjecture formula includes con contribution from a trivial solution sometimes. Right, I mean, conjecture it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So if I want to take the for the limit, I have to send all the omegas to infinity. No, how, how do you take? I mean, for the limit yeah, here. But, but then, um, well, I guess the Q, PQ per camera should tend to some. Uh, no, but uh, let's let's ask question geometrically. I give you phi sphere. What well, do you want to get phi sphere from this? How? Yeah, but I mean, no, it doesn't work. No. I mean, sometimes you can do for the limits, but I mean here. I'm unaware how to get out of these things, I mean, any uh, 4D limit. So the thing is that if you try it for at the level of one guy to do something, it blows up on another way. But geometrically, it's very clear because if you have a sphere and you start to squash it here, then it goes like this. So, you know, five sphere does not, not, does not have any good 4D limit and, and it's purely obvious geometrically. So these formulas you also cannot do. At the same time, if you think about this answer, it's something very amazing because in Nikrasa formula, 5D formula, there are epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and there is a beta. There is a democracy between these parameters, but beta stays sort of outside. It's instant on counting parameter. What you actually do, you symmetrizing over these guys and taking an integral. So in a way, it should be a very wonderful object. But, I mean, 
even uh, studying this explicitly, this object, it already takes time. Yeah, five minutes. I can stop it now if you want. And uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think I don't want to tell you anything more. And I feel like I failed actually to deliver the message because it's, uh, I mean, vast subject. And uh, but I tried to tell you that there is a very nice structural things and at least. I was trying to stress on mathematical side, but there is a physical side, supersymmetry, everything works. But Guido told you everything last week, so it was not my job. So you don't worry, there are formulas, everything works. Uh, I was actually trying to stress the mathematical part. So for example, in general, for toric guys, uh, we conjecture the same thing, that for more complicated toric guys, for example, Sasaki and Stan, you will have more complicated toric diagrams. And for Every closed report, but you just put a uh, you know uh, copy of Nikrasov partition function, and exactly which your epsilons, etc. You can read from toric data around fixed, I mean around reorbit, etc. Again, it's a conjecture answer. And uh, but I think I will stop here, and if you have questions, I may answer them in the remaining four minutes. Questions. You mentioned you have some good reason to stop and save the machine. Yeah. So uh, what is the reason? Uh, it's the same reason why you stop with superconformal <laughs> series in 6D. It's the same reason as purely... You cannot construct this uh, template? Um, the thing is that you cannot actually put... So the reason related to supersymmetry, you cannot uh, put uh, supersymmetric uh, young mills on eight dimensional sphere preserving, I mean, sort of nice amount of, uh, I mean, symmetries. That's, that's the main problem. It's related to supergroups, but in a way 7D, it's related to the fact that seven uh, minus one, it's equal to six. So it's the same thing like num classification. So num classification, you cannot have superconformal, I mean, theory beyond, I mean, because there is no unitary representation. So there are similar things. Of course, you can put still, 8D theory on some manifold, etc. But the problem is that it will not be related to supersymmetric theory with good symmetries. That's, that's what, I mean, it's basically related to, um, so this is uh, argument is stated in our paper with John Minahan. So uh, you have to look at supergroups with correct asymmetry, with correct symmetry of the sphere, and beyond seven, there are nothing. Of course, you can still try to put seven, eight dimensional young mills on eight sphere, but you have to make bigger sacrifices. That's the uh, only thing. I mean, but in a way, at least from 2D to uh, 7D, the story looks very uniformly and nice. Other questions? So uh, we started with real generic omega. But, mm -hmm. uh, so the function seems to not admit to, uh, or does it only go up rational? No, I mean, this guy, I mean, if you look at these things, etc., you cannot have real omega, it's a divergent. If omega is real, this is, has a modulus 1. It doesn't make sense. Yes, but I mean, uh, often for the single epoch conversion, people say that it only blows up at rational points, and it doesn't make sense for, ir for irrational ratios. So does something similar hold for the double one? Uh, I think so, yeah. I mean, the story is very much the same thing. Once you go outside of a rational points, uh, I mean, once you go outside of generic points, you have to think more. So that's what Nikrasa was telling you yesterday. I mean, and uh, I mean, there are other representations of these partition functions which we can have when omegas are rational. If they become rational, then, I mean, many things just fell down, etc. Other questions? Forty five, I'm done. Okay, thank you.